Amen. It's good to be out in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. <clears throat> you know something? I've always loved to worship. And you know, I really think that a, a Christian likes to worship. There's something about worship that brings peace to the soul that nothing else does. You know, it, you, you're finding a connection with God through worship that settles the soul like nothing else can. And also, it settles the soul, but it builds something that you rely on in hard times. There's a strength that is built in worship that you rely on and draw from in hard times. You can be seated. So I'm just going to do a, uh, questions and answers tonight. My voice isn't the best. I've been coughing real bad. <clears throat> so you'll bear with me with that. And I just figured it probably give you guys a break and give myself a little bit of a break uh, because I didn't think my voice would hold out. So at any rate, uh, I always like to read the scriptures before we go. This is a, um, a David here in the 34th Psalm. This just kind of stands out to me, uh, has stood out to me this attitude, and so I wanted to read it. Maybe it goes on what we were saying about worship. But at any rate, David in the 34th Psalm, he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Amen. David was a man after God's own heart. But there was something about David. Is David always held God in such high reverence in his own eyes. And I know that we, we say that we do. And I'm going to open it up to questions. But we say that we do. We hold God in high reverence. And we should. But sometimes I, I ask myself, do we hold him in, in as high reverence as we should? What I mean by that is when times get tough, do we kind of maybe question him? Why? Why did you let things? Why did he let things go this way? You know, and I, and I feel like if we do, which is... In our nature to do. But I feel like and think sometimes if we're doing that, we're not holding Christ as in high regard as we should. Because if we hold him in his proper place, is that he does all things for your good. There's no evil in him. And if he allowed it, and you're his son or his daughter, and you've been in the way, and it's not calamity because of your own unrighteousness your own sins coming back upon you but you're in the way and calamity befall you how could it not work out for your good you see and when we question things and I'm it's not like I'm I'm ignorant of these things or devoid of such actions but because I've done them myself and so it's not like a, a, a holy thou you know, uh, question here. But I had to ask myself, I said, Peter, when, you, um, when you're questioning God like that, it's almost as if he's not big enough to take care of it. Sometimes I think I have a tendency to worry at times. And um, let me tell you something, just a little personal. Sometimes I have a tendency to worry. I got it from my mother. Worry about things before they get there. And my father passed. And the oddest thing happens, friends, when someone passes, some of the oddest things will take place. And unless you've had a real close loved one and experienced such things, you won't know. I never knew it. But when my father passed, the first thought I thought about when I heard that my father had passed is the fact that I had never, in his 75 years, in my, at the time, what was about 46 years. In my 46 years of life, I never one time ever, not one time, saw him nervous in the slightest. I never saw him shaken. Not one time. Not even in the slightest. Not so much as for a half a second in all my life. And it's funny when I had heard 
that my father died. That was the first thought to come to me, and I had never thought that thought in all my life. Never even noticed it about him. Never noticed it about him. And then when I heard that he died, that's what I thought. And, um, and then the next thing that came to me that Paul, uh, where the Bible said no testament is complete without the death of the testator. Means your testament, your testimony in life is not complete. No matter who and what you are, it's not complete until you're dead and then they can close the book and write the last chapter. You see? And um, maybe that's why it came to me. But at any rate, sometimes, back to my thought here, sometimes I've thought or worried about something. Well, and um, you know, you hear the recessions coming and maybe your company's starting to lay off or just different things like that. You know, I'm just trying to put it to everyday life and you start to worry about it. Well, I hope I won't get laid off this and the other. To me, I, I was thinking to myself, Peter, I think when you do that, you, you don't give God his proper due. As if he's not big enough to take care of you. As if he's not bigger than the economy. You see? And then the natural thought, yeah, but I've been through hard times, you see? I've been through recessions. I've lost things. And then the next thought would be, as if it wasn't all for your good. It made you the better man. You see, God knows what he's doing. And he doesn't tie himself to naturalism the way we do. You know, the natural portion of life. So at any rate, I want to, uh, that's just my thought free. Um, so let's open this up to kind of just, just general questions. Uh, if anybody has a question, just let's, you can raise your hand. Okay, Juliana and Peter's in the back. We hit him, Juliana. Okay. So I was just wondering if you could explain exactly like what is the logos. Okay. Yeah, so she was saying that uh, some people, they say the logos is Christ. And then she wants to know if I can explain the logos. Okay. So first off, um, the, the, the word logos obviously is a Greek word. And John was pulling it from the Greek. But he was using the Jewish in the Jewish understanding of the logos not the greek understanding of the logos let me explain the two difference and this is how sometimes it causes a little bit of controversy in our understanding or a mix-up okay so the jewish or the greek understanding of the logos it was this the greeks understood it and it comes from socrates and more actually plato's understanding okay of the logos in this right here the greeks believed that the almighty the creator of all uh, the creator the the almighty whatever source whatever you may call that he was considered the unmoved mover meaning that he could not be moved by anything okay also it would be if he could be moved by any external source that that would be belittling to who and what he is okay so this is so what this is what the greeks believed so then they believed also that in his high and lofty state the unmoved mover could not be bothered with the affairs of anything that was in the natural world. Okay? So what he did is he created uh, uh, an emanation, he, Plato called it, an emanation. Or, and this was sort of a demagogue. And what it did is the emanation acted as the go-between or encumbered itself with the affairs of the natural world. Okay? So then it was a lower, remember a demagogue, which is a lower god. That's what the, uh, the, the word demagogue means. It's a lower god. So, at any rate, and then it can be encumbered with the natural affairs of the natural world. And it can be pre oppressed upon and moved upon. Okay? So, the, that, that emanation... The Greeks used that word as logos, an emanation. That's the Greek understanding of it. So then when you read back, w w there's a problem in, in theology or understanding. You, this is in many things, not just theology, but it, it gets exponentially greater when it comes to theology. But there's a problem with reading present day understanding back into 
old text or history or anything of that nature. When you, when you take present day understanding, whatever it is, and you read it back into it, okay? Because l words don't change, but language does, okay? So words, we might have a word that's been around for a hundred years, two, three, four, five hundred years, and the meaning of that has shifted over the years. So words don't change, but language does. And then the same thing with understanding. So then if you try to take often present day understanding, so that's actually what a lot of the Greek theologians or the Greek apologists are actually called in the second, third, and fourth century of the church. They were Greeks. They came from Alexandria and the Greek-speaking world. And what they did is they, most of the Greek apologist of the Christian church apologist means someone who argues for a case so the Greek apologists who were trying to argue for Christian doctrine just about all of them Justin Martyr all of them the the Cappadocian fathers Basil of Caesarea all of them were reared in Greek schools in pagan Greek cultures, in, under Greek rhetoric. They came into Christianity, and then they started trying to read back into their present-day understanding of the Greek term and the Greek theology of Logos. They tried to read it back into the Jewish understanding. Okay? And you can see where this would hold, uh, would would cause problems. Now, the Jews, and I won't get too deep into this because this would be a month of Sundays on its own, but the Jews believed had a strict doctrine that even the Jews to this day um, hold. It's called the Shema. Hear you, O Israel, I the Lord God am one. They say it every day. Okay? Hear you, O Israel, I the Lord God, I am one. Okay, that's called the Shema. Okay, well, now, John was taking the Jewish understanding of God and he was using the Jewish understanding of the Logos. Now, here's the Jewish understanding of the Logos, okay? You remember, <clears throat> I want you to hold that, that Greek understanding of the emanation, okay? So, you remember, if you take, you remember that the, the pillar of fire appeared to Moses in the burning bush, Okay, now at the same time, that same pillar of fire appeared to Paul. And Paul immediately recognized it as the Almighty. That's why if you read in Acts and you actually trace the, the verbiage back to its original text, you hear Paul actually said, Who are thou, Lord? It's capital L-O-R-D. Okay, which means the Almighty. Paul recognized that whatever's standing before me is the same thing that stood before Moses. Now the two people both, Paul, uh, Moses and Paul, both had that testimony that the pillar of fire is the one who called them. Okay, the, of the biblical <clears throat> writers, they had that understanding. Now, on a side note, the apostles did it, but they had the same understanding, but they had it in, a, in, a, in a, a form that was different than Paul in this respect, is they knew the man Christ Jesus, and Christ said before, our, the Pharisees said to Christ, are you greater than our father Jacob? And they went on to talk to, talk to him, and he was going back and forth, and he said, listen, before Abraham was, I am. And unless you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. Okay, now the King James puts it in italicized there. He, the word he is italicized. It's not in the original Greek. They added it, okay, to try to make the sentence flow. But actually, so then it would read in your King James, unless you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. But that's not actually what he said. Listen, his understanding of himself. Christ said, before Abraham was, I am. And then unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Why? It's because if you take him anything other than the I am, anything other than the I am, then you've made an idol 
in your worship on a false god. But if your understanding is he is the I am, that's why Paul referred to him as Elohim. Okay? So when he recognized him, he said, I'm Jesus whom you persecute. Now, if you look at that, that Logos, that, that pillar of fire as the Logos, remember, it, it was the beginning of the creation of God. If God had a beginning, it was that. Okay? Now, you go back to John 1.1 1, 1 is where we pull this from. John sa- explains it in this respects. Remember, each one of the, the four gospel writers, they each had their understanding of God. And John being a prophet, the other ones were, they had different callings. But of the four gospel writers, John was the only one that was a prophet. And a prophet usually, he sees into the spiritual, that's where his gifts lie. You know, and so immediately, instead of starting with the lenience like the Dr. Luke would do, John immediately circumvented all of that and looked right into the spiritual, and that's what his gift picked up. And John looked, and John said, now watch this. In the beginning was the Word. Well, what is the Word? The Word was that pillar of fire. What else could you call it? You see, and I'll explain this in a second, what I mean by that, what else could you call it? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. When I say it was with God, it's because it was in His mouth. Okay? Then it was God. John 1.14, he jumps down and says, And that Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Now, that's what Christ was referring to when He said, Unless you believe that I'm that, you'll die in your sin. Because if you see it as any other thing, then you're an idolater. You see? Or if you reject it altogether, then you've also, in the same thing, you've rejected your salvation. There's only one way into heaven. That's through the perpetuation of the shed blood of Christ. So then, now, let's go back to what what John saw it. In the beginning, well, if you take this right here, that God dwelt completely alone all by himself without anything. There's not light, there's not darkness. There's not gravity and there's not the absence of gravity. There is not, there, there is no such thing as space, sea, and time. There's not matter, there's not the lack of matter. You see, we can't get our finite mind around that, but there is absolutely nothing. And this is before all things. God at this point has not even uttered the first word. And you think, okay, so at this point God has not uttered the first word. Okay, so then we, let's go back a billion years. No, 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 let's, let, let's go back a trillion years. Yeah, he still hasn't uttered anything. Let's go back a trillion, trillion times a trillion years. Yeah, he still has never uttered anything. He's not even tapped his finger yet. Where does God dwell at this point? Where does that dwell? Well, we all would recognize immediately we have no clue and it's incomprehensible. Okay, not only is it incomprehensible to you and I, it's also incomprehensible to the angels. Okay, the vastness of God, it's incomprehensible because we are limited to our current knowledge and understanding. So are the angels. Well, they're above us in their knowledge and understanding, but they're still limited to their knowledge and understanding. They have perimeters to their knowledge. They have perimeters to the, what they can uh, understand like you and I do. Okay, there are perimeters. Okay, back before all of that, God had not done anything. Now, w- billions and trillions and quadrillions of years, and he still had not done anything. There came a spot in the vast eternity because there's not even time yet. There came a spot in the vast eternities when he spoke. You see? And that very first utterance is God's first word. Now again, why it causes so much confusion is because the Greek apologist, the understanding of the Greeks runs so close to this. Remember the Greeks believed that there was three there were three great powers in the universe. And one of them was the word, the power of your rhetoric. 
your, your words, what you can say, the power of rhetoric, okay? Because the words have, have the ability to ri- make nations rise and fall. You see, the Greeks believed there, was, there were three great powers, and the most powerful one of them all was word. Okay, so then, the Jewish understanding, again, John is articulating this, that when he spoke, that word started to form, and it started to form into that pillar of fire. Now, if we can have a proper understanding of this, you go back to Philippians 2, Paul explains this a little bit better, but if you have a proper understanding of this, the Greek word here is emorphe. And it, it, morphe means transferred, but not in any way that we can conceptualize, but I'll give you the best that, the way that I can put this, okay? The Greek word emorphe means pour out. But we, when we do something, we pick up a pitcher and we pour it into a glass, okay, we pour the contents from this vessel into this vessel. There still is a remnant of the original vessel there. But the Greek term does not hold that connotation. The Greek term holds the connotation that there's nothing left back there. All that was here. So then if we could take a, 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 a floating, you see sci-fi nowadays, a floating ball of liquid, water we'll say, whatever, liquid. And it's in a round ball. And it pours itself, not into a pit, a, an additional pitcher, but it pours itself into another form to now, instead of a see-through, um, instead of a see-through, ball of liquid now it has poured itself and it sits as a white cube hard all that was here is now here okay so then that's the jewish understanding the logos poured himself into that pillar of fire what or no excuse me not the logos but all that god was poured himself into the logos okay At that point, we have what we could feasibly understand as a beginning. You see, before that, there's nothing that we could relate to a beginning. You understand? Because there was a beginning of, there was, there was not at that point before that, there was not anything that had started yet that we could relate to because God always was and he hadn't done anything yet. So then all that he was, he poured into here. Now, that is the Logos. Now we get understanding is that, now that Logos one day is going to come out and take on human flesh. You see, and that's what, at first it spoke to Moses, it took on human flesh, it went back up into heaven, then come and spoke to Paul. Now, The understanding, that's what he says, that's what he meant when he said, unless you believe that I am he. I am. But what else would you call it? Nothing but existence. Eternal and present existence. You couldn't call it anywhere else. That's what Moses, Moses was trying to wrap his mind around this. And he says, okay, so I'm going to go down there, talk to all the Jews, the Jewish fathers. I'm going to go talk to Pharaoh. I'm going to tell everybody that an entity has sent me to talk to them. To whom should I say this entity is? What's his name? Is it the great Ra? Is it Malak? Who is this great entity? Well, now remember the Jewish understanding of the Shema. I am the Lord God and I am one. Okay? Can you say, if you were try, to try to give him... Any other thing than present tense one would be to detract from him. Because that's actually what he was or is or whatever. Even before time began, he was still the present tense one. So that's why when he said to Moses, I am that I am. To put anything else to that would be to detract from him. That's why he phrased it in that manner. I am that I am, so they go tell them I am sent you. Now, look at this right here. Because it was that pillar of fire, what was it though? It didn't consume the bush, so it wasn't a natural fire. 
You see, so then he's, in, he's indwelling or he has become, if I can say it that way, he's, he has become a body, an entity. You know, and that almost is to take away from him, to refer to him like that, but he has become. But yet it's not natural. It doesn't burn the bush. But yet it looks to us. Well, it, that thing, same thing followed Moses, and it was a roaring cloud that would go 10, 000, a roaring pillar of fire that would go 10,000 feet into the sky and could be seen from all the nations around. That that great roaring fire hung over the children of Israel, their tent. You see? Now, that very same thing took on a body of flesh one day. Okay? And then when it came back, it looked at Paul saw it sitting there. Now, here's the Jewish understanding of this. The Jewish understanding of that great huge pillar of fire. They understood it that that, bar, that entity, that form that he was in, it wasn't natural, so then what is the only other thing you could call it? Spiritual. Right? Spiritual. And if it's a spiritual body, what, what is a spiritual body? It's an angelic body. That's why they would call it the angel of the Lord. You see? Because he was in an angelic body. An angelic form. A non-natural form. That's why you see it all throughout the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord appeared unto Moses. The angel of the Lord descended. You see? The angel of the Lord. Then that same pillar of fire, that Logos, descended down on the church at Pentecost and then divided its, himself in little licks if we can imagine it this way, a lick about three, four inches tall, and went over and sat over top each one of the, of the individual who, to, uh, who were gathered there. And then as the only logical, next logical conclusion you come to is it dropped down inside of them. You see? Because from that day forward, Peter was not the same Peter that we re had, had read of prior, uh, previous to that. What had happened? That same pillar dropped down. Now you understand what the Bible means when it says, we have the Spirit, of Lord, uh, the Spirit of the Lord by measure, but Christ had it without measure. You see? So, but what was Christ? Christ, the word Christ actually means, is the, the Greek, the Greek derivative, or no, it's not even a derivative, it's actually a direct translation. The Greek translation of the Jew, the Hebrew word Messiah. And the Messiah means anointed. Okay? Anointing. That's what it means. Anointing. So one of these days, there come, there's coming. Shake his hand. A man. Shake his hand. Pat him on the back. Flesh. Not pat him on the back and your hand goes through him. Not a spirit. But a physical man, you pat him on the back. But he is the anointed one. The one that has that same logos. That was back in the beginning. Now, remember this right here. So I want to give you a proper understanding of this. When in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, because by the time it had finished rolling out of his mouth, everything that was back there was now in there. You see the understanding now? John is actually in the spirit of being prophetic. He's following you a timeline of progression. You see, in the beginning was the Word, first thing. Before that, you couldn't call anything a beginning because God had no beginning. So in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God because it was in His mouth. Then it was God because there was nothing back there. Then it was there. Watch this right here. All things were made by Him. And with out him was nothing made that was made. From that point of that Logos in that form, he made all things. You see? 
then John uh, continuing following the, pro the, the, the linear progression, that Logos was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and glory. You know, you see, then he walked in darkness. They that sat in darkness saw a great light and perceived it not. They did not perceive what it was. Okay, that is the Jewish understanding of the Logos. You see, now, here's where the real complication comes in. There was a, a Greek, a, a, a Greek, or not a Greek, a Hebrew writer by the name of Philo. And he was an obscure thinker and an obscure writer, unadorned in his time. And he was abstract. And the Jews considered him somewhat of a, 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 a nut. But Philo, being the Jewish writer, he tried to synchronize the Greek understanding of the Logos with the Jewish understanding of the Logos. And the Jews rejected him. Now, once the Jews completely handed the gospel over to the, um, uh, to the Gentiles, when we say Gentiles, what do we really mean? By and large, not 100%, but by and large, we mean Greeks. You see? I mean, you can say Romans too, but before the Romans got a full grip of it, the Greeks had it. Okay? <coughs> so, because they were the intellectual thinkers of the world. All of the Greek apologists, with the exception of none, were raised in pagan Greek schools with pagan Greek understanding. Justin, all of his life, called himself the Greek apologist. You see? And he even openly proclaimed that what I want to do... Thank you. <coughs> and uh, Justin Martyr was about 174. What, what I want to do is... The great intellectual thinkers of the Greeks, they look down on the religion of, the, uh, of Christians. They see it as lowly and unintellectual and ignorant, the, a religion for stupid and uneducated people. But I want to show them that it can actually be compatible with educated Greek thought. So he developed a, 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 an idea which was starting to become a little, somewhat popular, but he popularized it, called synchronism. To take the teaching of the Jews and the teaching of a pagan culture, and because this, and later in the Roman period, did not reside only with the Greeks, but to take the religion of the Greek, uh, or of the pagans, and blend them two together to where now the pagans can see a, a great similarity of their religion in the Jewish religion. And it makes it more palatable. Now the Romans, a.k.a. the popes, said it makes it more palatable to the pagans. The Greeks thought that it would make them think that it's more intellectual, that maybe there was something a little bit more thought-provoking about it. Now to do so, what Justin Martyr did is he said, remember the Greeks' idea, he said that the great unmoved mover was God the Father. And there was a time when he was alone by himself. Then what he did is he created the Logos as the emanation, the demagogue. So actually Christ, became, Christ is actually the demagogue. But before he was an embodied Christ, he was the emanation, the Logos. That's what, okay, now, that caused a great problem in Christian doctrine that lasted for at least another good 250 years because what that did is he said there was a time when Christ was not, so then that made Christ lower than God the Father, which created a doctrine called subordinationism. So what we have now 
is a God and a gimme God. One lower than the other, one who created the other. You see? Now that's going to, when time goes on, up, getting up into the 300s, this is 174, getting up into the 300s, that's going to develop into the Aryan controversy because you make subordinationism. Okay? But now when we go to read, we take the, Jew, or the Greek understanding and try to read it back into the Hebrew text and we can't make it make sense. We get so confused if we take the Greek understanding, there's no way you can reconcile the Greek understanding with this Bible. But if you take the Jewish understanding of God, the Shema, hear you, O Israel, I the Lord God am one. And you take the Jewish understanding of the Godhead, then open up your Bible and read the Jewish understanding of the Logos the Jewish understanding of the angel of the Lord, then it all becomes crystal clear. You understand? So then, if that helps a bit, again, I told you, I don't, this doesn't do this subject justice. You know? But um, any rate, just to give you a little bit more, two, uh, maybe one more minute, because Justin Martyr caused such controversy and made a, a subordination and developed subordination immediately after, then Origen tried to come and clean it up and said, well, I know that Justin said, and Justin was right with a lot of the stuff that he said, but he said there was a time when the Logos was not. And uh, so then that's not quite true because uh, they're the exact same. So then he's begotten. Well, then, then the question was, well, then if the Logos was begotten or came from or made from, the Logos was begotten from the Almighty. Well then, how can, he, if he's begotten, how can he not be lower? Or a time when it was not. So then, then the Cappadocian fathers, uh, Basil and Gregory of Nice, uh, and uh, they come along, the three Cappadocian fathers, and they started saying, well, no, what it is, it's he's be eternally begotten. Well, that didn't even make good uh, in common sense eternally begotten but see i don't and i don't believe i'm not saying that i believe the men's motives were wrong their premise was wrong they're taking a greek understanding of god and trying to synchronize it into a jewish religion it's non it's it cannot be synchronized you see that's the problem that's why it's so important that we take, that's why it's so important we keep our Old Testament. It, you know, in the, uh, in the church today, it's become a, a, um, a very popular doctrine to say, we, we believe the New Testament, we don't, we don't need the Old Testament. You see? And um, so then, no, but remember, Paul, as Paul said, they are the root. We were grafted in to their root. You see? Without, without the root, we have no standing, the Gentiles. Well, then there, there came a lot of uh, religions taking the same thing. Religions from the East, Babylon, came into Christianity and they tried to do the same thing. Well, then what they said is, yes, it's right. There are. He was a Logos. And, and the Logos was, was, was a demagogue because the Greeks had originally got their religion from the East. And the East had believed in uh, a demagogue and an original emanation from uh, uh, from the creator, the the from the Babylonians. They had originally believed that. So what they come in and they started taking the Greek thought and they were like, yeah, that's exactly what how we see it. But you're not quite seeing it correctly enough. So they started saying, well, what it actually is. Remember that the the original emanation was actually. The, uh, the, they, they were equal. And the one decided, now watch this right here. This is actually becoming very popular, okay? It's just a, re, a recirculation of old ideas. They said they were actually, they were equal. One created the physical world, and the other did not create the physical world. He created the spiritual world. And their rivals, okay? This is uh, coming from the east. Now watch. And the one who created the physical world 
did so that he could take spirits and imprison them into the physical world. But the one who had created the, the spiritual world desired to set them free. Okay? The one who created the physical world was the God of the Old Testament. The one who created the spiritual world was actually Jesus. Now these were called, in Christian history, called Manichaeans. Okay? They, but they originally came from the east. Now, let's go flip it back just a little bit. They went on, a splinter group from them went off and said, yes, the one who created the natural world was an evil deity. That's why he wanted in, encapsulating man in flesh. He wanted to keep him bound in flesh and keep him ignorant. That's why he told the original progenitors, Adam and Eve, to not touch the tree of knowledge, good and evil, because he wanted to keep them ignorant. So that they could not partake of knowledge. But then the light bearer, the true spiritual light bearer, wanted to set them free. So he tried to come into the prison house of the Garden of Eden to set those people free. And he wanted them to partake of the tree of knowledge. To set them free. His name is even the light bearer, Lucifer. Netflix just came out with a cartoon. And that cartoon teaches that very thing. There was original people, Adam and Wanda, in the Garden of Eden. And the evil demigod trapped them in a body of flesh. But Lucifer, loving, loving humanity, wanted to set them free. And he tells that whole story. That's the new cartoon that's on Netflix, right? Or not Netflix, Amazon. A prime right now. But do you see, you see what it is? Is he, on all of these things, it's taking pagan religions and trying to synchronize them into the Jewish understanding of God, and there's where the misunderstanding happens. You see, the Jews never did that. It wasn't until they handed it off to the Gentiles. That all of that stuff started. The Jews knew who their God was. You see? They knew it. And after the Babylonian deportation and they came back, they never fell to that stuff again. They never questioned it any longer. They knew who their God was. You see? But when Christianity was handed from the destruction of the Jewish temple in AD 70, from going forward from that time, it was a slow transition. There was, the Jews dispersed because there was, there was no physical place that was holy on earth anymore to go back to. So the only thing left is, is to disseminate into the far reaches of the world. Well, as it did, the Jewish understanding got less and less and less and less because the Jews got less and less. And in its dissemination, the, Gre the Gentile numbers were growing in the church and the, and the Hebrews were lessening in the church numerically in a per, for a percentage wise. So then misunderstandings about the nature of God started to rise. You see? So then that's where all the misunderstanding comes if that helps. Um, so then I have time for one more short question. Okay, Pete. Okay, so this is a philosophical question. If you do a morally evil thing with good intentions, does it make it good, the deed? Or vice versa, if you do a morally wicked thing with good intentions, does it make it... I just said it that way, didn't I? Or, uh, and if you, make, if you do uh, uh, a good thing with wicked intentions, does it make it wicked or good? So then I, I personally think this is a philosophical question, you know, that goes back, you know, as, as far as further than the Greeks. I personally think what it is, is let's just go take the premise of you're doing a, a morally, 
a morally good thing with wicked intentions? Does it make it good or does it make it wicked? Or is it wicked? Well, I think the problem is, the problem is, is you're trying to convolute two, in, two different acts into one. And then you're trying to come up with a, a one answer. The thing about it is, is there, there, are, there are two different acts. Here, let me explain to you. Okay, break it down. So then, for example, if you're going to go give a homeless guy 20 bucks to buy a meal with, this is a morally good act, isn't it? But if you take your cell phone and take a picture of yourself while you're giving it and then post it on social media, well, the intention was evil, right? The intention wasn't good. But you did a good act, but the intention. So then the question is, does it make it good? Well, then... Again, I think the problem arises philosophically is when you try to make them one, they are two. And if they remain, if you keep them two, then it's easily answered. There, there's two acts going on there. One is the act of you feeding the homeless guy. The other is the act of you wanting to publicize yourself as virtuous across the world. Two acts. The one is good, the other is evil. If you slide them together and make them one act, well, then you're, they're always going to, you're always going to have an amalgamation of, com, uh, of conflict there that's going to come up muddied, gray. It'll never come up clear. But if you separate them, then, then they both become clear. So if that answers, I think that's the answer to it. Uh, the musicians come. We have to, I was going to hoping to get more questions, but I, I don't think we have time. <laughs> Juliana, if she asks one, there's going to be deep, I can tell you that. <clears throat> How many love the Lord? You know, I'm always fond of saying, I believe this is true. <clears throat> you, you want more, <clears throat> excuse me, you want more power in your life, put more Christ in your life. Remember this, church. First off, and in a lot of these doctrinal questions, they don't pertain to salvation. They will. They do pertain to your relationship with God, but they don't pertain, pertain to salvation. I, 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 differently than than many people, is I don't believe differences in doctrines separate brotherhood, and I don't believe they put us in and out of the church. You see, I believe people who can have a difference of opinion as as far as right from left. on many doctrinal issues whether you're the infant baptism or, or adult baptism or you know different things is God in the wafer or is he not these different things I mean these are vastly different understandings of God however I, be, I believe this emphatically that by grace are you saved by faith are you saved through grace and that not of yourself it is God's free gift Christ said, he that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He did not say, he that believeth in me, and also believes in the correct form of baptism, and also believes in the correct form of communion, and also believes in the correct form of, has everlasting life. He didn't say that. That's us, we do that. And I do believe there's a correct interpretation. And I do believe people are more, some people are more correct than others. But I believe that salvation alone salvation in the economy of the almighty that's by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ you see it's not our denominational walls that puts us in and out it's not our individualized church it's not our particular Bible translation it's the blood of Christ that puts us in and out you see and there is an eternal security of the believer that if you believe in the blood of Christ I'm going to read you one, one other verse. I was thinking about reading it to begin with, but I didn't. Psalms 32, blessed is he whom, whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Sin, singular, unbelief. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Blessed is that man. How do you get there? Through the blood of Jesus Christ, there alone, 
trusting in the blood of Christ, He was enough. He was enough to get me through every single thing. One of these days, this robe of flesh will drop, this veil of flesh, and we will rise to, as we stand, we will rise to gain the everlasting prize. Do all that you can to make sure that your treasures are laying on the, in the beyond, friends, church. That your treasures are laying there. I'm not saying don't have a good life here. Have as good a life as you can. But remember, this is just a blip, a dot, one period in a whole library of your existence. It means so little in compared to everything else. You see? So, remember, Christ said where your heart is, where your treasures is, that's where your heart's at. Be mindful. I'm not studying this old world. My treasures are not here. My treasures are, are laying in the beyond. There is a land that they call the sweet forever. And we only reach that land by faith's decree. One of these days you will drop your robe of flesh and grab the everlasting prize. Make sure you don't have any regrets. Make sure you don't have any regrets. Don't at that time, how many old people, and i got to end this out, how many old people have held their hand as they were coming to death and they go, oh, I, I wish so bad I would have. And they go, son, make sure you I wish so bad I would have. Don't do that. Don't be there. Don't be that person. Give every day. Give Christ your all. Every day. Live it to its fullest. But give Him your all. Every day. You will be a fulfilled Christian. You Inside. Oh, you'll have troubles in this life as Christ told us. But inside you will feel clean. And you will feel good with your Savior. Nothing between, remember the old hymn, nothing between me and my Savior. Nothing between. Make sure you live like that. Amen. You want to live like that? You want to live like that? I want to live every day like that. Oh Lord, if there's anything in me keeping me from you, if there's any, if there's any stumbling stone, any darkness in my life keeping me from you, Lord, take it out. Take it out. While I'm in the Spirit, Lord, because I'll get in the flesh and I won't think this way. While I'm in the Spirit, Lord, I don't care if you have to run me through hell and back. Take it out. I don't want it there. That's my honest to goodness will. Now, when I get back over in the flesh, I'll scream and cry and say, I don't want it. You say, I'm just, I'm honest. I'm honest. But while I'm in the Spirit, God, take it away. Don't let it be there. You see that? That's our prayer. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, what a grand privilege it is to serve you, God. God, what a, a just a momentous occasion to be able to come out into your house and to bask in your spirit and to take a greater portion of you with us home when we go, Father, than, when, than what we had when we arrived. God, what, a, what an awesome, almighty Savior you are, God. We are not worthy of your presence And of your august presence, shall I say. But thank you, Father, for humbling yourself, stooping to sinners such as I. Stooping to become a part of my life. Thank you. I was unworthy. God, I ask you to bless each and every one, God. God, help me to, help me to live As if I'm appreciative like I really should be, Father God. Every day of my life, Father. Help me keep my eyes on the eternal prize. Help me keep my eyes on on my blessed Savior who died for me. God, may that be also the prayer of everyone that's here or everyone that goes in the sound of my voice, even in the ages to come. Let that be their prayer. Let something down on the inside of the inside reach up. And even unbeseen, let it reach up and say, that's my prayer. And may it blossom into a beautiful branch. In your precious name, holy name, amen and amen. How many love the Lord?